Oh yeah! Tron's back, baby. There's a new Tron game. There's a Tron ride that just opened at Disney World. And there's a third Tron movie coming out starring Jared Leto, which is a choice. It's a curse. All I want to do now is return to the grid and reconnect with the first and second Tron entry. Wait a minute. This isn't Tron Legacy. Tron 2.0 is a sequel to the 1982 classic, featuring the voices of the original cast, updated art design by the original artist, and a brand new electronic soundtrack that's also... original. What? What's Tron Legacy? Wait, what? So, yeah, apparently we're at the early stages of the next chapter of Tron, which marks the third attempt that Disney's had to rev up this franchise. Of course, there was the 1982 classic, which had a rough go in theaters, but slowly and surely built up a pretty sizable cult following. We can honestly talk about Tron all day, right? So, we can. We so, can. So let's I have just been for 40 years. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> does it ever get tiring? I can tell you still have like that. Then we had Tron Legacy in 2010, which did much better in theaters, but not quite well enough for the higher-ups to feel comfortable going all in on the property. That's not to say that Disney didn't try their hardest. Both movies were merchandised like crazy and had all sorts of toys and books and lots and lots of video games. I mean, come on. Is there better marketing synergy than Tron in video games? Come on, yeller! <laughs> oh. But in between 1982's start to the franchise and 2010's relaunch of the franchise was a stealth attempt by Disney to rev up interest in Tron, but in a totally unexpected way. Rather than take the traditional route of having the movie pave the way, with merchandise following behind it, where the real money from the movie is made, it was decided to flip the script and have a video game lead the charge. We've worked with the team at Disney who wants to make the next movie. Yeah. And uh, so we're making sure that we're very consistent with the first movie and that the game is actually the real sequel to that movie and then the next movie oh. that comes out will be the continuation from there. Oh, that's that's pretty cool. So it's one of the first times a, a film company has ever tried yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Now something like this wasn't completely unheard of at the time. In 1996, Lucasfilm had created Star Wars Shadows of the Empire to explore the possibility of merchandising a movie that never actually existed. Still, a bit different than a game intended to relaunch Tron for a whole new generation of consumers. Tron 2.0 arrived on PC in North America in 2003 and was developed by Monolith Productions, who these days were last seen rolling around Middle Earth. In the late 90s, early 2000s though, Monolith was one of the premier development studios when it came to story-based first-person shooters. I mean, Blood, Aliens vs. Predator 2, No One Lives Forever 1 and 2, these are all classics of the era, so it's easy to see why Disney would want them to build the on-ramp for the next chapter of Tron. But before we get much deeper into the circuits that make up Tron 2.0, let's do a quick recap of the original movie first. Because if you're like me, the only thing you really remember about the 1982 original is... And... With a little bit of... 1982's Tron focuses on Kevin Flynn, a brilliant computer programmer turned arcade owner who just so happens to also be trying to hack into his former employer, Encom. It turns out that he had been working on a string of successful video games that a rival engineer stole and presented as his own work. That engineer has since been promoted to senior executive VP of Encom and has been ruling the company with an iron fist. Apparently, Encom's master control program has become a sentient, power-hungry AI and is 
also been blackmailing this senior executive into doing his evil bidding in the real world. You wouldn't dare. Part of that evil bidding is to apparently lock other programmers out of the system, including Flynn's former co-workers, Alan Bradley and his girlfriend Laura. Alan has been working on a little program by the name of Tron, which is designed to protect NCOM's system against hostile takeovers from the likes of, I don't know, something like a master control program that has become a sentient power-hungry AI? You will each be part of me, and together we will be complete. Flynn, Alan, and Laura all team up to unlock Tron and download evidence against this evil executive. The plan fails, the master control program catches Flynn and ends up zapping him inside the NCOM mainframe. It's here that we're introduced to a computerized world filled with light cycles, weaponized identity disks, larger-than-life evil overlords, and living, breathing programs that look like the user that created them. And it's really this modernized high fantasy aspect that really seems to connect most people with the franchise. Well, that and the visuals. If you're gonna do a Neutron anything, you gotta capture that iconic, instantly recognizable look. So how about Tron 2.0? Does it nail some or any of these? Does it feel like an honest-to-goodness sequel or just a cheap cash-in on the name? Why has it gotten completely left in the dust and totally forgotten in both the Tron and gaming landscape in general? So, does this game look like you're even stepping into the world of Tron? Yes! 1000% yes. This project having Disney's full support meant that the developers got access to Sid Mead, the visionary concept artist behind not just the look of the original Tron, but also classics like Blade Runner, Aliens, and Time Cop. end result is an in-game world that captures exactly how you'd expect a modern version of Tron to look. I honestly don't know how to describe it other than to say, yeah, it looks very Tron with the neon and the blues and the reds. And the developers have done a great job mixing up this Tron aesthetic so that your environment looks different as the location and story progress, just like the original movie. So traveling through the mainframe feels different than traveling through a firewall or a PDA. Speaking of that story though, you plays that couldn't have a more 2000s named Jet Bradley. The Jet is short for Jethro, and the Bradley lets us know that this is in fact the son of Alan Bradley from the first film. We also learn that the game takes place 20 years after the events of the original Tron, and that since then, NCOM has been taken over by a company called FCON. Alan Bradley, voiced by the original actor Bruce Boxleitner, is still at NCOM and has developed a new AI system named Mithria. Alan gets mysteriously kidnapped and, when Jet goes to investigate what's up, he ends up getting zapped into the mainframe. the Mithria needs his help fighting off a virus that's taking over the system. This virus just so happens to have been the result of an evil executive who literally became corrupt attempting to digitize himself. It's a whole lot of narrative setup that's really just getting you into the computer world. That's all we really care about, and that's exactly where Tron 2.0 takes place. Once there, we get introduced to a whole new cast of characters, including a program named Mercury, voiced by Rebecca Romaine, who was kind of a recognizable name in the early 2000s. Where we had it. You and Doctor to start with. And then if you're able, I thought I might take you home to my bed. Yeah. Who is Mercury's user? Are they good? Are they evil? Is it Kevin Flynn? What day is this? Nah, it's not him. He's not even in this game outside of infrequently showing up in email fragments spread throughout the levels. We'll get to those in a sec. Okay, so no Kevin Flynn. Surely Tron is present somehow, some way. Name is in the title, right? Yes, kind of. So Alan Bradley has been developing a new Tron program called Tron Legacy. The thing is, we never actually see this update in any kind of human form like we did in the movie. I mean, we do end up getting an older digitized Bruce Boxleitner, but here he's Alan Bradley, not Tron. So while that's kind of a bummer, there is still a ton of backstory connecting the original movie to the game, just in the form of email nodes. These are spread throughout each level and give nice little updates on Flynn, Alan, and Jet, and really just give a nice sense of a family dynamic, and help sell the idea that Jet has taken over the Tron mantle, even though it's not exactly called out. You're leaving, aren't you? This is no world for a user. You're too crude and rudimentary. 
We're not ready to exist here. Not yet, anyway. Promise you'll search for me? Of course. I guess this is... end of line. We even learned that, soon after the events of the original Tron, Alan and Laura got married and had a son. You! But soon after the birth of Jet, Laura is fatally wounded by an NCOM digitizing laser and ends up having parts of her personality integrated into Merthria. This explains why Sydney Morgan, the original actress who plays Laura in the movie, is handling her voice here. Why me? Alan 1 was not available. Alan 2 was. Now when it comes to the gameplay, parts of it hold up better than others. Like I said, the developers at Monolith were really known for their first person shooters, so it's not really a surprise that that's what this game is too. Now because this is Tron, you gotta have disc combat and yeah. That's here, and it's a highlight. When I played through, I pretty much just stuck to using my identity disc and all the upgrades. Outside of that, the other weapons are generally disappointing in that they feel like stuff you'd see in other shooters at the time, just with a cool looking Tron skin. There's a shotgun, and a sniper rifle, and a machine gun, and grenades. This is also the case for the enemies, which start out firing off discs that you can block or deflect and actually have some pretty satisfying combat with. But eventually, Eventually, they also start just coming at you with shotguns, and it just all feels very forced and out of place for this franchise. What doesn't feel out of place, though, are the light cycles, which feel like they've been taken right out of the movie. Sid Mead even created a brand new design for a super light cycle just for this game. Unfortunately, there's not much super about it, other than it looks like a cross between a totally normal Tron light cycle and the bike from Akira. You're also not going to be spending much time taking in the visuals here because the opponent AI is just brutal. They'll box you in with split second timing so that your silly human reflexes won't have time to react. And so by the time you hit that second or third light cycle level, you're pretty much done. All that being said though, Tron 2.0 is just so much fun to look at and walk through that it's hard not to recommend for fans of the franchise, even with the hit and miss combat gameplay. And even for the most casual of Tron fans, you can often pick it up on sale for only a a couple of bucks. I mean, that's a pretty sweet deal for a quick trip back to the grid. But we're not done yet. And neither was Disney when it came to their mid-2000s attempt to jumpstart Tron back into the mainstream. The game initially launched with a small toy line, but over the next year we'd get an Xbox port, we'd get a mobile phone racing game, we'd get an action RPG on the Game Boy Advance, and we'd get a six-issue comic book series that continues the story from the main game. So you can't say that Disney didn't make a legitimate effort with Tron, it just never really caught fire the way they hoped it would. And looking at the video game landscape at the time, it's kind of easy to see why. Gone were the days of the straightforward narrative shooter, and in its place emerged industry-defining titles like Halo 2 and Half-Life 2 and Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. There just wasn't enough oxygen left in the mainstream for a video game sequel to a 20-year-old Disney movie. Of course, there was eventually a real deal second Tron movie in 2010, with its own unique vision of a modernized grid and updated backstories for all the characters. And with it came the question, what about Tron 2.0? Is it still considered canon? Surprisingly, the filmmakers would address this in a screening interview for Tron Legacy. Actually, yes. It was important to us that we recognize the events of Tron 2.0 as part of the same time <laughs> I'm just kidding. They completely ignored it. And so all we're left with is a fun but dated slice of what could have been for the Tron franchise that Disney was still able to market the heck out of. Which does leave me wondering, how many other examples are there of Disney using a video game to test out the waters of a franchise? What? Oh, Jack, come on, man. You know I've already covered the Forgotten Nightmare Before Christmas sequel with the new story and the original cast and the brand new songs, and, and you've already seen that. Haven't you?